And I live in a temporary use project in Forêt, where I live, and I co-manage the project that is happening there. I have been asked to moderate this speech today, so I'm here for this and to guide a bit the time, because we don't have much time. Um, the panel talk today is within the frame of the European Lab, which is happening for three or four days. And just for everybody to know, this discussion is streamed live over the internet. And if you want, it's available afterwards still at uh, the European Lab's Facebook and YouTube channels. So to the topic, a new era in temporary occupation. 15 years ago, the use of empty space was generally automatically connected to illegal squatting. Then over the past 10 years, a new practice has started to emerge. Temporary use started to become legally, politically and socially accepted practice and form of occupying buildings. And in only 10 days, we're going to launch STAN. STAN stands for Social Temporary Use Network. And it's a network, an international network, that will gather European associations, organizations and structures that are active within social temporary use. With all this in mind, and all this development and movement, is it possible to say that we are already in a new era for temporary use? And for this, we have four guests here today, very exciting guests, if I may say. And I'm going to start with, on my left side, we have Max. I'm just going to take my notes. Maxime Said, he's a co-founder of Comuna, a Brussels-based social temporary use platform who aim to transform empty buildings into urban commons. They've been active since 2003 and they're just getting more and more active. Um, Maxime has a background in law and he currently coordinates temporary, yes, the temporary occupation, the Tripostal, which is at the Gare de Midi in Saint-Gilles. Then next to Max, we have Jan Verheijen, who is member of the cabinet of the State Secretary Pascal Smet, who was coming today, but he had to excuse himself. Pascal Smet is the Brussels State Secretary for Urbanism since this July. And before this, in the previous government, he was the Minister of Mo Mobility and Civil Engineering in Brussels. And we believe, well, that temporary occupation is within his realms of action, and this is why Jan, representing Pascal Smet, is a perfect invitee to sit here today with us. Then next to, Pas uh, to Jan, sorry, we have Hanne, Hanne van Rösel, who has done her PhD at the Faculty of Architecture here in Brussels that belongs to KU Leuven. And her PhD was related to temporary use. Um, she is now part of the collective Josaphère, and Josaphère run a temporary use project in the wasteland of the Parc Josaphat in Scarbeck. Yeah, just the wasteland. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And right at the edge, we have um, Marcis, Marcis Rubenis, who has flown in from Riga. And he's a co-founder of an association over there that's called Free Riga. And it's a platform for organizing social temporary use in vacant buildings. And they as well have been active since 2003. Marcis manages one of their quarters where he also lives and he's also responsible for finance and for any kind of owner relationships. And now I'm going to pass the microphone to our first speaker. Thank you. Just need to make sure this works. Yep. Do you want me to click this on? No, it's fine, I will do it. Hello everyone. So we have vacant offices, um, abandoned factories and churches, empty houses, even um, social housing units. And if we put them all together, we reach a total of 6.5 million square meters of empty buildings here in Brussels. So 6.5 million square meters. That sounds like a lot, right? But it's not so obvious what it is. So just to give you an idea, um, it is the size of the municipality of Ixelles. So for the one who don't like Excel or don't know Excel, it's two times Saint-Gilles. So wow, sounds like big. So I have an announcement for people here in Bossard this afternoon with us. Um, in Brussels, we do not have 19, but rather 20 municipalities. Woo! So the, 20 munici the 20th municipality is the one composed by all the vacant slots and empty places in this city. 
So this is actually totally crazy, right? I think it's even more crazy when we consider the fact that people are still sleeping outside, that people are queuing sometimes for about 10 years to get access to social housing, and I'm not even speaking about the people who are just looking for a space decent and cheap to work or to do some art. So that's exactly why in 2013 we've created Comuna. The idea was to transform these empty places into community places, uh, which would be functioning like urban commons and open to the neighborhood. So basically, we call that um, temporary use. So the idea is just to use this building when it is empty and give it a purpose for a while. So it's like kind of a triple win-win, we say. So first it's a win, of course, for the people who can use the space because they have access to something cheap and decent to live or to create. Um, it's also a win for the neighbors because they used to have a neighborhood with abandoned, creepy buildings and now it's all alive. Um, and then it's also a win for um, the owner because his place would be empty for a while, cost money, energy, time, and now it is occupied, alive, maintained, assured, secured by a community. Um, so we've been doing that for a certain while, and we call this practice um, social temporary use. Why do we call it social? Because the main purpose of that is to serve the common good and the general interest, the temporary use, is there to provide space to create and to live. Um, so that's a great idea, right? Many people are doing this. We did not invent anything. There are many actors doing that. But also some people start thinking, wow, that's also a great business there, maybe. There's a niche. There's something we can use. Um, and so some companies, often private and for profits, sometimes multi multinationals, they come from abroad and they call themselves anti-squat. So now they don't call themselves like this anymore so often because it's not so sexy, actually, when we think about this. Um, their main purpose is to maximize profit, and so that's why they would use space. They use the same tool, temporary use, the same tool that we use, but in a totally, radically different vision. Um, so this has many impacts. The first one would be that there is up to, I would say, zero social added value to the temporary use. So let's say in an empty building we can do a lot of things, but we can also organize a defile for Prada or Dior in the basement, and it's exciting, right? Or we can also sell super expensive beer in a popular neighborhood, but then there is no added value for the neighborhood. And the other one, maybe worse, would be um, the rights of the tenant. So basically in such places, with the practices of these companies, people can be kicked out within 48 hours. You take your stuff, you get the fuck out. Also a manager can come at any time and check how you live, because you're not really a real tenant, right? Mothers with children cannot live in such places, because that would be hard to kick them out, maybe. So they prefer not to allow them. Um, so basically, here we have, like, we have something that we cannot accept in a way. Um, and knowing that, we gave ourselves a mission in Comuna. The idea was to bring back life in these empty spaces of the 20th municipality um, and turn them into citizen lab organized by and for the citizen. So we've been doing that for a little while. It grew and now it's a, it's a non-profit organization with about 10 workers, 10 currently occupied buildings, a bit more than 50 inhabitants, 100 projects that are hosted in these places all around Brussels. Um, there's also the question of network, we'll talk about it later, I guess. Um, and with the time we get some institutional recognition also doing these, this, this work uh, in Brussels, in Belgium, also in Europe slowly uh, with our partners, I hope. Um, but that's not really what matters here. Beside the work that is done on a daily basis, I think what we're trying to do is to demonstrate that the city can be totally different. What we're trying to do, building after building and temporary use after temporary use, square meter by square meter within that huge 20th municipality, is to make a proof of concept that we're able now to build a city where everybody feels included, where we can live public space differently where a new economy can be tried out, uh, where new practice can, can live and flourish all around. 
Um, so about that question of a new era of temporary use, um, the idea is to say that yes, we believe it is possible for it to come now, but for that, we will need the support of every citizen to help the 20 municipality to survive. We will need the help of the public authority to support and also to protect that 20th municipality from this market-based approach, that extractive approach that uh, I've mentioned before. Um, in Comuna, we believe that the transition is already there. We believe that us and many other stakeholders are already doing it on the ground. There's also a brand new government um, with big ideals. And so the question now is to say, are we going to be able to actually make this transition right now? And I believe yes. I really wonder what's your opinion. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, I would like to um, again uh, excuse the state ministry who would love to be here, but unfortunately this uh, was not possible. And to immediately relate to, to what you just said, I think the fact that uh, Pascal Smet wanted to be here is indeed a first sign that the, um, your, your demand is something that we want to, to take really serious and that is one of the one of the, on the forefront of, of our policies. Um, if, so we will, of course, we will uh, mostly speak, um, so uh, Pascal Smet is responsible for urbanism, so we are, uh, uh, we are more uh, responsible for the l l legislative uh, part of um, um, temporary use, whereas temporary use, I think, is a, is a general responsibility for, of the whole government and, the ho and all the government bodies. That's why it's also some, very present in the government declaration. And so, from our point, point of view, I think it's first very important to stress that um, every use of a building is in a way temporary. So if we make, um, if later we make the um, the, the relation with legislative measures we have to take or we can take, it will always, a first question is, okay, what is temporary? Is temporary six months? Is temporary two years? Is five years still temporary? Um, it's something important to um, take, in, take in, in mind. Um, as you already stressed in, in, in your um, contribution, um, we come from an era where temporary use in Brussels was completely absent, where buildings were completely um, left um, falling, falling apart, falling into pieces. And I think if we look at the things positively, indeed, over the last uh, years, uh, we, we, we already s uh, saw a lot of uh, initiatives, and I think with different um, angles. You have, uh, uh, for instance, um, the, your initiative, uh, the Common Shosafat, where it's more about experimenting how to uh, reappropriate a site. Your, there's your, your, your uh, initiative around uh, Tripostal, where, it's, where I think it's a lot about um, uh, installing a temporary use to uh, engage the neighborhood in a, in a large development project. You also see uh, private initiatives not maybe the private initiatives you were talking about, but private developers who own buildings that go in, uh, through, um, through a big uh, transformation process and where you see a dynamic between the private sector and associate associations and also the architects to, to use pr temporary occupation to, to more like, um, to make like a, a pre-configuration of what the future project can be. I'm, I'm making allusion to the project of the World Trade Center in the North area. Uh, so, and, and I think that's very interesting relating to your, um, your presentation of the 20 uh, commune. There is 6.5 million square meters available of unoccupied real estate for temporary use. So, one of the, um, one of the um, main lines in our policy will also be that this shouldn't be something uh, of 
private initiatives against uh, associative um, initiatives. I think there is there is space enough for everybody, and our our role as a government will be to to streamline uh, this to also promote uh, temporary use in order that um, in every uh, situation uh, everybody uh, and every initiative can have the, um, the right uh, chance. So if I, if I then go on to um, what, the, what the policy will be. Um, so first of all, um, this government and our uh, state secretary wants to promote uh, um, temporary use more than it has already been. Um, so we, will, uh, we, will, we are in charge of all the development projects, all the building um, permit, all the projects which need building uh, permits. So first thing is to um, make people conscient, conscient about the, the ID because some are, some are already conscient, some are not yet conscient. Um, then there is, uh, and this will be a collaboration between uh, our state secretary and the other members of the government. There is the proposal in the policy declaration of, um, of a counter for um, temporary use. This counter will have like two sides. First of all is to make a uh, up-to-date register, a continuously up-to-date register of spacious, spaces which are available for temporary use in order that initiatives who are looking for spaces uh, can uh, easily uh, find uh, opportunities. The other part of the counter, and, and that's more our side of the counter, is um, more the, the aid with two initiators on, uh, on, on the permit question, because uh, in every or in almost every project of uh, temporary use, there will always be um, uh, some permit issues because um, it's not because things are temporary that they don't have to be uh, regulated. Then um, also the, the government declaration stresses a lot on um, the fact that in all public projects, and there are a lot of public projects which will become um, concrete over the next uh, three, four, five years. Temporary use should first of all be open to uh, not-for-profit initiatives and social initiatives, initiatives that uh, relate um, the projects to uh, their neighborhoods um, around. And, um, and last point is uh, so we will take uh, some legis legislative initiatives also around temporary use. So one of the, um, one of the big legislative uh, projects of this government is the, um, is the minima importance. So all the, um, in, all the um, in, um, interventions in buildings or on sites which don't need a permit or we only need a small permit and temp this will be this is more than just temporary use but temporary use will be one of the access around um, the around uh, we will work and um, yeah that's um, that's our uh, contribution for the next uh, years thank you I'm really happy to hear the, the link being connected to the big development projects that are also really uh, at stake here in Brussels. Um, I'm going to take a bit more the position of my background as an architect uh, and a researcher, although I'm also um, partly a practitioner. Um, my research has been in a design-based participatory action research. That's a mouthful to actually say that um, I've been doing academic research while literally having my feet in the Yosafat mud and looking together with citizens what temporary use or rather transitor, transitory use can mean uh, for our city and for the discipline of, of architecture. Um, and one of the reasons why I started with the subject or why I'm so engaged with this is that I, as an architect, but also as a citizen of Brussels, as a human being, I am frustrated with some of the 
neoliberal mechanisms that are at stake in urban development, in our city, in Brussels, the place where at the end of the day we live, we be, we are, and we see more and more actually how market mechanisms are taking over, uh, making that some people can't afford to have a roof above their house, while, as Maxime nicely addressed, some buildings are just being empty, sometimes because of technical issues, administrative issues, but often also because of speculation, developers waiting for better times to, to develop their area. And as such, um, as architect, researcher, uh, Brussels citizen, uh, I've been looking for how can we actually build our living everyday environment uh, and look for the best quality of being together. And that's where the concept of the urban commons has come in. Um, Maxim also referred to it. Uh, I don't know in how far everyone is familiar with it. I'm going to try to be short in the definition. Uh, but in generally, in, in the scene of the urban commons in academia, but I think also in practice, uh, it relates to this idea that we have private actors, uh, we have um, public actors, but there is also a third way possible, and that is citizens working together, uh, claiming their right to a certain resource, but also taking responsibility for that certain resource and um, making sure it will sustain and every can, can benefit of it. Uh, a nice example of this could be clean air, which is also uh, a good issue for Brussels. Um, it can be knowledge. Wikipedia is an interesting example of how knowledge can be taken care of by a community. And so more and more people are looking to adapt this concept also to the urban environment. Because although commons is an old concept that has been actually very natural before the industrialization, uh, today it has been highly privatized and we've been highly arriving to a dynamic of public or private. Um, so how would this be contextualized in an urban context then? Uh, and there are some nice existing examples. I think the nicest one we have in Brussels is the Community Land Trust, where actually housing development is taken out of market mechanisms. Um, I'm not going to go in detail, but the idea is that the ground of the area remains shared, and so no speculation mechanisms can happen anymore, and it's about having affordable housing on the long term. And so based on like this idea of the commons and the potential it has to find an alternative for a system that is running into multiple crises, uh, the collective of Common Josephat has come together. And Common Josephat has been a platform of engaged uh, citizens who saw all these issues and all this potential and were like, how can we make this concrete and how can we develop that? And so they looked at the Josephat site, not a park, but the nearby 24 hectares big urban wasteland. Uh, which is owned by the region and which will be developed in a new neighborhood. A new neighborhood of 1,800, I think by now 1,600 housing units. So uh, this is uh, going to be a big, big share of the 20th commune going to the two other communes, uh, Skarvik and Iver. And so the question is like, okay, we basically almost have an empty land and how can we then, if we have all of this possibility because it's regionally owned, it's in hands of a public actor, which we assume is more in interest of its citizens than in, in gaining profit. How can we actually make this into an ideal, sustainable neighborhood for Brussels? Um, and a lot of great ideas have emerged from that. There is a booklet published, 40 pages. Uh, it can be found on the website of Common Josephat. Uh, but there was also frustration because that's a really nice idea. We've done studies to prove that financially this all can be possible, but what does that mean in the everyday? What does that mean today? And so that's the moment that with a couple of uh, citizens we started to occupy the Josephat land, or a part of it because 24 hectares would be a bit ambitious. Um, and it started with a community garden, uh, with a mobile kitchen, and later on we have been adding out a house, but it's not just a garden, a kitchen, a house, Huisten en keuken voor die in die Nederlands zalig zijn. These everyday interventions, all of them had like a great vision behind them, or like an ambition or principles. Uh, it's not just a community garden, it's being able to produce your own food in the city touching nature, having your hands in the ground, and deciding about how to manage that together, how to take your responsibilities together. 
Uh, the kitchen is using food leftovers that we recuperate. Uh, it's about being careful with our resources and then sharing them at a prix libre, at a, like a free donation price, to be more social and show other economic models are possible. The house that we are building is not just a house. It's actually uh, almost one person building it on its own, by hand, of recuperated materials to show that actually we could make our own houses at like 400 euro price and we would be free of this pressure to work hard and long hours in order to be able to just have a roof above our heads. Um, and so it's based on these like everyday experiences, these citizens uh, really working hard and struggling to work together uh, that we have been engaging in this temporary use. Uh, temporary use which by now we managed to also find a relation with the public owner slash developer of the area, the SIU. Uh, and in which we are also looking for how can this sustain in the long term, because that at the initial base was the clue. And that's why I like to talk more about, let's call it self-proclaimed transitory use, because as you nicely mentioned, everything is temporary in a way, but every temporary activity also leaves a trace and can become transitory or change things. So just one simple guardian can mean a lot for people in their everyday life, but it can also show that citizens can take responsibilities, that citizens are looking for other ways to, to take care of their public and green spaces. Um, and so in that sense, I think it's really important, linked also to the bigger urban development projects, to really take care of what do we put behind this temporary use? What is the vision behind it? And we can see how now in the region, increasingly more of the organizations of the region or the municipalities are engaging with temporary use. The question is, what do we want to develop in that temporary use? What kind of dynamic do we look to, to create? And how do we deal that? How do we foster it? Or how do we get it in a certain vision? Okay, guys. Um, I was gonna. I was. I was gonna basically start uh, telling about what free Riga is. I'm from Riga, but then Max told it kind of all. Just substitute Comuna uh, with free Riga, and the story is there. So we're also the twentieth commune in Riga. There's a huge amount of empty spaces. I didn't know that, but actually, com commune is using the same win-win-win idea. So. I mean, like, I understood that I maybe could um, define myself as um, 29th uh, European state, representing 29th European state in, in a sense that uh, there's a whole generation of organizations currently that happily we discovered together with these guys, uh, started discovering a year ago, who have the si same identity, the same uh, genes, the same DNA, uh, who are kind of not this confrontation type of squatting based, but are rather market based. How can we use the market to access the empty spaces? At the same time, they have the social as their aim. So this commons or social economy, or call it as, as you want, there are hundreds of ways how to say it. And that have been born around 2013. So I'm, um, I'm one of them, but uh, about Riga specifically, it will be fine. Oh. Uh, about Riga specifically, uh, the interesting maybe perspective that Riga is uh, shedding. So Latvia is a uh, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, the Baltic countries uh, are the post-Soviet spaces, you know, and we have we have been experiencing extreme of the neoliberalism 
in many senses, because from collectivism, forced collectivism that everybody kind of, you know, didn't want anymore and it wasn't working, lies, empire of lies, we went into a very high individualism. And therefore also market forces, therefore there are these, we have counted around 500 empty buildings in the historical center of Riga, there are probably a thousand. So it's basically the market which is not working, Economics, the free market is not working, it's squeezing out the life of the city. And especially in, in our context, which also differs from here, we don't have so much municipal support, state support, because there's less money and there's less, um, let's say, institutional um, capacity and understanding how to involve yourself with social and, and economical processes. So um, that's quite extreme in... in uh, in the other other places of especially Eastern Europe, uh, which is not uh, not this region, but um, what did you? Oh, okay, okay, no, no, it's fine. Um, to to tell you shortly, you heard we're also a platform for uh, coordinating and and uh, helping with social temporary use. We have had. Um, uh, many spaces. We started maybe, which is also a little DNA thing, we started with this uh, little Occupy Me sticker. There were 5,000 stickers printed out during a festival, arts festival, when many organizations came around this um, frustration that U Riga was European capital in 2014, European cultural capital. But in 2013, we had the feeling that there's no space for culture. So that's the squeezing out of the life of the city. So culture doesn't have the space in the European capital of culture. How comes? Um, and uh, we have also nice spaces. This is all what, uh, what Max uh, uh, told. This is the quarter that I'm managing. Last study, 200 years old buildings. Uh, some Soviet buildings. We have uh, more this uh, hipster, trendy, um, contemporary arts and culture destination quarter. It was created in one year. All this is like phew, one year. So actually, owner invited us there in this quarter, large in, in the city center, abandoned uh, sanitary transportation base where they repaired emergency cars and so on. Um, so, in, owner invited us to co-develop it, basically to pre-design, as, as you mentioned. Uh, owners are interested in social temporary use to give life to the spaces. This is another like, uh, little lesson for us. Um, but basically what I want to say that, um, yeah, this is this generational idea that in Europe, in whole Europe, there's a whole generation of similar organizations which are using market mechanisms to enter the spaces, to somehow get access to the spaces that have been taken out, taken away from, from people. And, you know, I come from Eastern Europe. I'm not a communist at all. Um, not at all. But I'm... I really like market mechanisms, but I see everywhere people try to use this market to enter the spaces, to incubate some kind of capacity and ability and examples show how much it's necessary, especially in Eastern Europe where people are just going away, you know, we, we are declining. Uh, Riga is declining as a city and Eastern Europe is a, as a whole declining, which can also happen here at some point. And without space, as a human right for social activities and community as a human right, these, these regions will be dead. And I think this is something that everybody is feeling, that we have to find a way how to get to the space in a temporary way, but then, which is my maybe bigger idea from this presentation, what I thought, is how to acquire these spaces for long term. Is it through crowdfunding? Is it through land trusts? Is it through uh, using like WeWork, but uh, stealing it for maybe really social ideals, not WeWork is social, you know? It's very social, but it's not. It's the biggest co-working space network that there is. Having IPO, in, um, initial public offering, getting money from the stock market, whatever ways, how to turn these empty spaces which are not working, uh, signs of not working market, how to turn them into permanent social spaces. I think from these organizations that is our generation, we are looking forward to, to have a new institution, like heritage protection in 19th century. It was just amateurs, just lovers doing it. I think we are these lovers now all over the Europe and stun this, uh, this camp in Paris that's happening in five days. It gathers currently, I think, eight organizations, which are the founders, but it will have more. I think we will be 
we are trying to be the new institution that will take back spaces so that they not just serve, like Tallinn's quota that I showed you, that we just add value and go away, but we add value and we can stay in part of the space, in whole space, buy it whole, I don't know, but somehow keep it social. So I think that there is a contradiction actually between market, I, I would gladly invite you to rig, uh, maybe there it's more extreme, there is a contradiction between market and between um, uh, social aims, social ideals. How to regulate that, I don't know yet. I think one thing that's really necessary is support these social platforms so that they can acquire, not are subsidized all the time, but are subsidized maybe in the beginning to acquire the space and take it out of the market. And maybe having less regulation is also a way because uh, everybody says no as Nant, uh, people from Nant City, City Council, uh, you know, they, they had this famous saying that, you know, when you come with temporary use somewhere, they said, everybody says no, you know, because it's temporary what it is, like what's the regulation, what's the use of this building, function, tra -la, tra -la, fair safety, you can imagine. Um, so maybe less regulation, some kind of lounge pad for organizations that want to take over the spaces with criteria of being social. That's uh, that I would like to propose in, in this discussion. Perfect. Martis, because I want to launch this conversation. If you can now all, you have three microphones to share with each other. I would like to launch this. this we have four microphones. Perfect. Ça marche, ça marche. Good. I'm perfect. We can talk all at the same so, time. <laughs> Because my first question is exactly, you're all talking about social. We seem to quite agree on social. What is social? How do we measure it? Do we want to measure it? How extreme do we go? Just everything together. What does it mean, like, for example, when you talk about community buildings, community, do they have to mandatorily be for social use? If so, what's the percentage of social? Are we not allowed to make any money in a building like this? And so on. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I can start. Um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe, a mis does it work? Yes, cool, <laughs> great, I have a microphone. Um, yeah, no, fast. Um, maybe, maybe the idea would be not to reinvent everything. Um, so I believe about, so if you want to use space and perhaps um, develop more culture, uh, as Marcit said, and to make sure that the city will stay alive because I think that's really what we're talking about. We also would need a balance. So at least what we, what we, what we try to create is not spaces that are 100% subsidized and that culture should be decided by a public authority within these empty space and just use them and subsidize everything. I think the idea would be also to find economical uh, models and balance which are um, based also on certain criteria and ethics. And so basically, just not to re reinvent everything, uh, there's something called social and solidarity economy. It exists, they have criteria, it's called MS. And so basically the idea is that um, we're having economical activities, but that the main purpose is not to make profit. You need a balance, you need to be able to pay the people who are working, you need to be able to pay the insurance, you need to be able to pay the taxes. But the point is not to generate uh, profit for shareholders, and that would be the only goal. So I think these are, this is one simple criteria to start with. There is also the question of the governance. So within this social and solidarity uh, economy, um, the idea is that everyone who works there has a word to say, just like in a cooperative where it would be one person, one vote, and that would be a way to also put criteria on what, what is done there. Um, and I think that the main purpose should be to generate social and to generate culture and not to generate money. Money is a way to make sure that it can run on the long term. I think that would be part of the answer for us at least. I think indeed, I don't think we should now lose our time with discussing like the le genre des anges, what is social, what is not social. 
Um, we think that as a government, we have uh, multiple tasks in that sense. It's first of all, support organisms that have a more social approach to uh, and a not-for-profit approach to, um, to temporary uh, occupation, but that's more the support to the organization that's not yet related to a specific project. Then on a project level, I think it's uh, specifically when it's about um, sites or buildings that are owned by the government, the government has a role to play in defining, okay, if we are doing a temporary use project here, what are our, what are our objectives here? And objectives can be multiple. Objectives can be about pre-configuration. Objectives can be about uh, accommodating um, needs that are uh, urgent. I think a, a perfect example that I didn't mention in my introduction is the temporary occupation organized by CityDev for uh, refugee accommodation. In, so it's, it's also a role of the government of uh, thinking, okay, we have a, we have a, a very urgent need here. Um, which are our options on temporary occupation um, to, um, to help um, these, um, these initiatives? And, um, and thirdly, um, I think there is also, I think we also have to make a difference in temporary use projects between the um, organizational part of the temporary use, um, where we have to make sure, and I think it's indeed a very thin line and a difficult debate, but where we have to make sure that things are done in a correct way, that legislation, and we are the first to try to make legislation as simple as possible, possible and that I think it's in the interest of both uh, public and social and private uh, players in this field to make uh, so um, that legislation is, is simplified. So there is, first of all, is the organizational uh, part, of, um, part of temporary occupation and on the other hand, there is the content what we are going to do. And these two things don't necessarily, not necessarily have to coincide in each project and on each site. I think, for instance, in big sites, you can say, okay, there is a um, one party, be it a so, more social party or be it semi-private party, who is in charge of the more lo the logistics of the temporary occupation. And then there are different... Um, uh, other parties um, more in charge of developing a specific project that's responding to the ambitions that are formulated by the initiate, initiator or by the end or by the needs of the neighborhoods and uh, the public um, network around it. And I think the, the global ambition has to be that we work to make uh, coincide all these uh, factors. So I, I, really, I really strongly believe that with these um, 20 communes, there is really enough food for everybody. And I think if we really push this even more forward, this temporary occupation, I, it's not a win-win-win, but I think it's a win-win-win-win. <laughs> Maybe also linked to this aspect and I think there the government has a really interesting role because just the government, I don't know how much percent of the 20th commune is actually like already belonging to the public, like as to say, and I also think there is like a great potential because if calls are being launched to uh, manage or organize temporary use, the calls tend to go for the lowest price. So there are other ways to deal with this, like setting the price and looking for the best content of the city for the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are like really simple ways that you can tweak some of the existing instruments to facilitate more social uses. Yeah, and I think this has been done specifically for the, the example of the Tripostal, so the, the Gare de Midi, which is like this huge building. Um, and in their call to project, they specified that it should, like they put conditions to make sure that this would stay in, in, like it would stay a social temporary use. And I th so they've done it already, and now I think it's a question of making it global and make sure that's the way it works. Maybe just, I would like to add, because 
I think it's tempting to say, oh, everyone can do it all together, there is enough for everyone, and like, in a way I agree. I also think we can consider empty spaces as something specific. It is out of market indeed. So there is, I think it has also a function of a lab. And we're now talking, and this new government specifically, but it has been said for a while that we need a transition, right? Also an economical transition. And so we need to try out things. We need a lot of experimentation. I think we've been experimenting quite a lot so far. We also, we always need to experiment more, but I think it's also time to really give means and, and, and to go for it. And if we say, oh, we can subsidize um, social activities by promoting uh, for-profit activities next to it, I think we're circulating in the same, we're just doing over and over, staying in the same system and managing on this one to save some money. I, 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 believe, I believe it is time really for social economy to work by itself with support of the public authority in some, in some manners. And I think these huge sites that you mentioned, they can work run by these organizations. That's the example I think that we mention very often in this world. In Paris, there is the Les Grands Voisins. The three organizations who are running the place are three non-profits organizations. And they managed to create something that is, I think, much more exciting than what we've seen in many places of huge sites that are open with a bar, etc. So there is ways to make social activities within the social economy world with an amazing result. And I think that should be the priority within these empty buildings for the region which promotes um, new economical models. This is where we should try them out. It's much cheaper than doing it in billions of dollars building. So let's do this. I would just like to know, talking about the Vantiam Commune and about exactly all the things that you believe in and that you want to promote, where are we at? What is the situation today? here in Brussels, but also in Riga. What, are there any legislations already in place? What are the projects that exist? Where are you going? What are you pushing for? And so on, what are you working on right now? Well, we are, we are in the, still in the beginning of the um, legislative uh, period, so we are still preparing what we are uh, working on. Um, so, as I already mentioned, I think indeed today, about its 20 commune, it's, it's a very global number, 6.5 million square meters, but indeed, I don't think we today exactly need to uh, know where, uh, where is what available. So this is the first thing that uh, the government has to put in place, is like a con continuously up-to-date inventory and also a, a proactive inventory because it's also thinking, okay, we know that this and this and this and this project is coming, is going to happen. So this inventory need, needs a little bit of uh, imagination, uh, to, so to say. Um, so in order um, to know exactly when there, when there are demands um, that they can be um, answered. And... Um, so the, the legislative um, uh, parts about the, the, the permits, I, I think I already noticed that one of the priority uh, legislative projects of the government is this uh, arrêté de minima importance. It's much larger than this, but temporary, we have to take into account temporary use as a very important factor. In the next months and weeks, uh, we will have several meetings with, um, with organizations like Comuna, but also others who have an experience in the field so that we can also nourish ourselves um, on the content, um, on what we have to change. And then a third thing, which I forgot in my introduction, that's why I was a bit hesitating in the end, but now it's uh, coming back. And it's something w on which we still, we don't yet have the, the right answer. But, um, so we are in charge of permits. So we also worked a lot with the profit uh, guys, the, the developers, who um, also come to see us and see and say, uh, we have a lot of troubles with these projects because uh, we go to see administration X and then we go to see administration Y and then we see the, 
the, the Baumeister met the architect and they all say something different and then we go into the permit process and then there is neighborhood protest and then and then the, 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 uh, the politicians start to change also their uh, opinion about the project, which is, of course, a very natural thing, I think, and I think something where we, one of, one of the things we want to uh, work on is coherence in, in building projects co and, and, in, and in the public instruction of building permits. Uh, which doesn't mean that we also have, always have to stick to our first opinion, but that's something in which I think for part of it, temporary use can play its role. And, and we, some private parties, not all of them, but some private parties are open to the idea that if you use temporary occupation as part as a, of, a, of, a part, of a participative uh, approach in the um, really in really in the in the, the start of your project, um, you can not in an absolute way, but you can to some extent limit um, the the potential danger of a project that becomes that starts to I don't know how you say this in English zwalpen. Uh, <laughs> Pendle between yeah opin uh, opinions of and and so th that's something uh, so this 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 the the right place of participation in the elaboration of a of a building project be it a public building project but also be it a private um, building project that's something on which we really want to improve um, I think it's something in which perfection will, will never exist. But it's something in which we really want to improve, and that's something where temporary use can certainly play its role. Okay, if I can react on it, I'm, I'm really happy to hear so. Uh, and I think also this concept of like building permits, trust, rules, uh, it's been also addressed like all of a sudden you have to fit with regulations. And I can see how that is a very big blockage for a lot of people who just want to try out something and all of a sudden they first of all have to find the owner of the site and which administration within Brussels is and there are people working on, on helping to facilitate this process but I think it's also part of the public actors having trust and taking risks and and maybe just allowing for things to, to happen faster um, and not wait to have everything in control and to, to know what to expect from it, but just exactly this aspect of like we're experimenting something new or innovating and if we want to change things in our system that we see that are not working, it is time to, to create an open freedom space within that system. Uh, and I think there, for example, in, in France, they're working on the permis de fer, so like a building permit for for doing things actually, for experimenting, and there also it will be really crucial, as you mentioned, to, to have a framework that is really clear about in which cases can we really allow openness, so it doesn't get um, for people realizing housing in more precarious conditions, but it is really for allowing people that uh, are looking for long-term solutions. Uh, two, two ideas also, listening to what you, you all said. Um, one is maybe more to uh, both for the market solutions and about permits and also social. I, I see here we have some urban experts in this audience and we, we, we will gladly probably could provide you with some cases but Bremen has interesting um, case of they have a temporary permit that is for up to two years easier with uh, fire regulations like in, in a sense that it guarantees fire safety but it's not the same uh, amount of investment required as if that would be a permanent 20 year renovation with 20 million budget you know it's just deals with the fire security and with maybe access to the space for organizing events making it easier uh, that's one idea that i thought uh, listening to you and the other one is is an example of riga which is also in one of the urbex projects it's one of the cases um it's about um and that, that more addresses the, how to facilitate social use of these spaces, which is easy then for the city uh, and for, for municipalities as such, and that's uh, property tax reductions. I don't know how this regime works here, but uh, I know that in, in London, in England, uh, they have something similar, exemption, tax exemption, similar to what we have in Riga. So if uh, that's helped us a lot 
You know, it's without so much regulation as what kind of project you will do, and the city must all the time follow that, but if an organization has a public benefit status, which we get from Ministry of Finance, and we every year we account about that, and we also talk with the city and show what we do, but basically if we have the status, then it uh, automatically guarantees 90% tax reduction of property tax for the owner who is letting in some kind of social use in, in the building. So those were two little ideas that I thought might be useful for, for your discussion. Maybe to put it on a, like very shortly, I think in Comuna when we, when we think about it, we, we see all the time the role of the regulator, of the public authority, should be, it's a difficult one because it's at the same time regulating and at the same time letting it be flexible enough to make sure that we're not suffocating with the new norms. So there's an equilibrium to find that there's a balance we need to look for. And I, th I think for us there's, there are th three main things. Um, one would be the public authority as a facilitator. Um, so making sure that the buildings are used that they make sure that their institutions, the social housing companies, that everybody is, it's easier for everyone to, to occupy these buildings. That, that would be one. Also to put budget there, because, it, I mean, that's also the joke. We need to take, in a way, it's great for everyone if the buildings are alive again, but then there are constructions to be done, uh, insurance to pay, a lot of work to be done actually for a building which will be used only for two years or three years or one year and a half. So how do we get back on the investment? So we need public money there. If it's a public building, that's for sure. And sometimes the amount are very low. And there's this idea that, oh, but you already get the building for free. And then you get a cave with no toilets, low electricity, and they want you to make something social, the smart city of tomorrow and the transition. And it's like... <laughs> So I think there is really a responsibility. I think most people understand. It's not like three years ago it would be crazy to ask for money to use a place. And I think slowly and slowly things are, are getting clearer. So that's the role of the facilitator, I, I, I believe. Um, the second one would be to protect. And that's really important. That's key. So we talked about the public offers and making sure, as you said, that the, the project will not be judged on the price. So there is an empty building, so who wants to take care of that building, and then two different organizations would come. One say, hey, I can do the smart city thing, I don't like that word, I can do the transition <laughs> thing, uh, I can do it with the neighbors, spend time with them to define the programmation. And the other one will say, hey, I'm opening a Dior thing, and so, but I'm, I don't ask money for that, of course, because you will pay with Dior. Uh, three, three times a week, it will make a lot of money. So I think this is a criteria sh that should be taken away and instead put, for instance, a certain price and ask what is the best project. That's, that's uh, another way to make it happen. Um, and I think on the, on the legislation based also, uh, as you say, there's the IME now, the Arrêté de Minime Importance, we're working on, the tax thing. Um, and I mean, it's also not a revelation, right? Like now, I think they're working on it for a while, and now there's this question of this guichet d'occupation temporaire, so I think the public authority is really working on it, and we need to feed them with great ideas, also coming from all around the world. You're right, Marcits, I think it's super relevant to say like, hey, in Riga we have this and this works, instead of reinventing here from scratch, like what would be a social temporary use? Okay, maybe it exists already elsewhere. <laughs> Yeah, and, well, I agree that there's like, it's really, I'm, I'm really happy to hear all of these things moving and then seeing that like on different levels and different aspects all over Europe, that is such a, a theme uh, which we're also collectively thinking on. Um, another aspect that I wanted to add to the discussion is we don't have to fill all the temporary use. I think our society has this tendency to fill all the gaps and have everything in control and close everything. Um, it still allows for other opportunities. And I think it's like, as you mentioned, this facilitation, it's more about a matchmaking between people who have great ideas or great projects who are engaged to, to bring some sort of added value to their, to their city or, or society uh, and matching them with like, just spaces that are available um, rather than necessarily looking to drag in people and, and, and so. Which is super short, yes. but key that I forgot to say that I think is important now that they're basically building up new policies. It's, 
Like, basically, the question is about how to institutionalize that practice. That's the question. We don't like that word, but that's what we're talking about. And I mean, the question is, there's also many small stakeholders playing for a long time, or people with less means that cannot do it in a professional way, or small collectives doing directly amazing things for migrants, refugees, cooking food, leftovers, housing for homeless people, self-organizing, squats, like, and I think all of this, the risk by doing it, even a positive type of institution, is to vanish all that scene. And I think that's also something that should really be in mind when we're thinking about that. I, I don't have all the answers yet, like, how we can do, but that's something we're also working on, and to imagine a way that everybody can really contribute um, within that 20th municipality. And I just, we have four more minutes before we open the question round. And I just want to ask one question that just comes up, and it's, where do you see your responsibility as creators of temporary space and temporary initiatives when it comes to sustainability? It's temporary, we say everything is temporary, it's okay, we agree on this, but this usually is transitory. You say you implicate your neighbors, the, the community, and so on. What do you do? How is, do, are you implied in any way in the responsibility of the after? Very interesting and relevant question. Um, if I can start, I mean, the part that we are at Yozafat, for example, as a particular case, has been with the aim to be like, hello, we're here, and like, we have an opinion and great ideas, we believe. And um, so it started more of like, um, hi. We're here, uh, we exist, uh, where it now slowly goes to like, you know, we have like worked out this chartre, this like manifest, uh, maybe if the day you once managed to launch your official open call for temporary use of Yosafat, which is in the pipeline, I think for four years now, um, then maybe you want to take into account what we have experienced by now and what we value. Um, it's also about like um, having a a foot in the door and like how is the development going now and who are the players at stake and can we maybe not talk to the developers that you're talking with to tell them of how we see it um, it's basically really looking for this like communication of, of what we're doing and, and asking to be involved and I think there the participation aspect is also really really relevant and a, a hot topic in Brussels because we there is a lot of criticism on how this urban development movement that we're having with these 12 new big projects coming and a lot of frustration about a lack of transparency um, and people just trying to to first of all understand what is happening and then to be able to express themselves uh, and I think there I want to use this opportunity to also stress that participation should happen as soon as possible and not when the plans are already on the table. And I think therefore temporary use can be really relevant because even before you know which program you want to put, you can have temporary use showing what could work, uh, what fits in a neighborhood or what clashes and to, to fail. And that it's okay in temporary use. That's not in urban planning. Maybe... I, w I would like to start with the paradox. Like we say, nowadays participation is key. We need to participate. It's very important for you guys to participate. You will have time in a few minutes to participate. Everybody needs to give his opinion. Um, and at the same time, what's more frightening for a developer to have the opinion of people on their project? Um, so I think temporary use is right in between because we want people to participate in the meantime. There's two, three years what should we do together here? How do you like your neighborhood? How can we imagine an urban utopia? But then in two years, we will build a five stars hotel. So like, and then I, that's a very, that, that's an extreme example. Um, never happened to us to have to deal with that. But I think that's just to, to give an image on, on where do we want to put the frame of participation. And I totally agree with you. The question would be, if we want people to participate, let's be clear on what they, we want them to participate for, and if we can use them for use super in advance and that we have no planning and say, okay, let's start with three years of like do whatever and see what happens, and from that to start to create something. And, and I'm not sure that's exactly the way it is right now. Um, so, but that's another question. I think the responsibility there of the, the, the operator of the temporary use is a tricky question. Right? And, uh can I just add one? Like, I think it's also responsibility of the citizens to participate and not just to give your opinion and run away, but to 
be part of it, active part of it. Um, talking about participation, um, I somehow, you know, we kind of, we told, uh, we told basically, I, I feel this dynamic a bit that we are telling how we want to see the, the world and what temper use is and why it's so good. But somehow I cannot uh, help myself not noticing that kind of it's a bit like ganging up a bit on you. So I wanted to turn the table and ask, so we have this, you heard, I think many organizations have this vision how to use more vacancy in a social way. From your perspective now, participating, us together, us first of all, what do you need from temper use organizers to privilege them more, maybe, than some market solutions? In what situations do you see that it's uh, feasible? And what do you need from us? Not that, I, I, sorry guys, I just noticed that we are the, this, that, and you are kind of starting to be in the, in the you know, defense, wanted to break this. Well, what we need, I think, is, um, so I think one of the, one of the roles of the government as you said, is, um, is the, the matchmaking between the available, um, the available sites and buildings for temporary use and the needs of um, the organizations or the, the, the fields. So I think the first thing we need from, from you is to have a good knowledge of what you do, how you want to do it, and, and, and what are, and what are the, the specific needs, and ideally, what are the specific needs in specific, specific neighborhoods. Um, I think that's the first thing what, what, we, what we need, and then, of course, but then I think we are repeating ourselves on this uh, legislative thing, is therefore we're really asking for your, uh, for your input. But there I wanted to maybe react on, on what you said, because and all, because I, I understood your last question more about sustainability, which we are now um, a little bit um, uh, forgetting. And I think in, to go again in this legislative and minimum importance discussion, I think we have to dis dissociate three layers or three levels. And that's why I, I started to say that it's very important that we are conscient that everything is temporary and we don't have a clear definition where temporary use starts and where temporary use ends. And for instance, if we talk about fire regulation, it's not because something lasts one day or one week um, that we have to be less, um, less um, stringent on uh, fire regulation. The risk, the risk in a temporary situation is the same risk as the risk in a, in a permanent situation. <coughs> Then there is everything which is sustainability um, and um, isolation nor norms, which are specifically in Brussels very, uh, very strict. There, I think it's very important that we come to some kind of clear definition. Okay, until six months, two years, five years, we consider something as uh, temporary, and there we can be maybe a little bit less uh, strict on some aspects, but still uh, with, uh, with the aim of uh, keeping everybody um, conscient about the fact that actually we have to be uh, sustainable. And then the third uh, layer, and that's the layer I think where we can have the most creativity or can be uh, where we can uh, write the most outside of the book. That's everything which is more related on uh, land use and urbanistic rules. Um, so my, my state secretary, my boss, he used to say uh, in, in all the discussions we had over the last weeks that he re he's, a, he's a, a lawyer, uh, basically. So he says for him, rules are important, but if a project is better than the rules, we sh the project should, 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 should prevail um, over the rules. And I think spe specifically in temporary use, we can, we can and we should have a little bit more uh, liberty with this than in things which are more permanent. And, that's, and then we can come back to participation and pre-configuration 
of sites. So I think there, and I don't think we have the, the right answer to it yet, but there we should uh, see temporary use as something positive, which can um, a little bit cut through the traditional dynamics of someone who is uh, proposing a project which is also derogating the rules, then everybody, the neighborhood, the politicians, the who is uh, attacking the project yeah, because you oh, that, that's not it's not uh, respecting the rules um, so if we can put this in more in the um, in the first phase of a project within a temporary framework that everybody knows okay we are now testing a little bit but it's don't worry it's only for one week six weeks six months one year we can I think we can try to find um, some other dynamics in some situations not Every situation will be uh, capable for that, but in some situations, I think we can find other dynamics. Super, thank you very much. I would like to open this panel talk now to a collective discussion question moment. I don't know if we have, do we have any extra microphones? Perfect, there's a microphone there. If anybody would like to say something, share something, ask something, do exactly that. Thank you very much. Super interesting uh, comments, sites, experiences. Uh, really, really cool presentation. And thank you, Bozar, for doing it because Brussels is special for the access it gives to this. I have three observations, very quick, and one, uh, one question. Um, Maxime, you mentioned uh, Camelot. Um, and I think I understand your, your opinion being critical about them. I experienced it in 2011 in London as a young student going to London and um, honestly in a very positive way because it offered a service that was a real alternative to private housing and super expensive housing. So I understand that Comuna can see it as a competitor but then it also has its role, it also offers a service so maybe, I don't know. No, don't uh, attack them frontally like this. Um, then about the commune, uh, I've heard many things uh, today. I haven't heard one thing that as an Italian in Brussels is striking, and that's aesthetics. Um, it's very interesting to discuss the economic role, how it can offer something. I see Brussels as being one of the places I've seen the most destroyed, where the historical architectural patrimony has been absolutely neglected. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time at SIVA, the Chiva, the, the architectural uh, archive, and, um, and yeah, there they, they know it. They have the designs of some of the most beautiful buildings in Brussels that don't exist anymore. So when they, when you, uh, criticize neoliberalism and speculation, maybe also leverage on the argument of aesthetics and how much has been destroyed for, I mean, yeah, look out of the window. Um, I also live in Rückeenveld. There was the beautiful, I mean beautiful, okay, it's not Rome, but still, it, it was beautiful. Um, the Solve building that now has been redeveloped into luxury apartments. I mean, I have seen few more ugly buildings recently than the one that they are about to finish. So that's, that's the third. Um, but then at the same time, I'm going to be also the devil's advocate um, in terms of the economic role that today, in today's economy, being realistic, the construction industry has. And I think something that the social in, in uh, innovation and the social experiments have to work on is yes you're offering something to the public that's great you offer something to individuals that's fantastic but being realistic in terms of how many jobs how much how many salaries are paid how much growth I know it's a very delicate I'm an economist in my background but like we say if Paris burns down the GDP doubles okay that's, that's a problem of our economic models, but it's also a reality. If we destroy and we rebuild, that's thousands of jobs, thousands of uh, profits, and In a social initiative, you have to find an alternative to this. And then the last point, um, I found super fascinating the post-communist experience uh, and the super neoliberalism. Um, 
rather than a debate between economic ideals, can we say that it's something more cultural about greed rather than making the market the devil? Like it's, uh, it's more something that can be seen in more individuals and uh, some greedy individuals can make the mess. Thank you. <laughs> that was a question, the last one? Yeah. <laughs> okay, no, I, I, think, I think it's, uh, you know, when, when you live in, in, in a certain context, you, you don't question some things, they become kind of, you know, given. For example, the fact that uh, Europe hasn't had, uh, Europe has had 50 years more, se six, 70 nearly years, of continuous de development of democracy and market uh, mechanisms means that you're quite rich guys, you know, comparably. Uh, I, reali I realize it in micro situations all the time. Uh, I think in Eastern Europe, it's rather that uh, this is the, basically second generation that's coming out of Soviet system where everybody was kind of poor and you had to be crooked uh, to, to be richer. So there's this like, uh, in Riga, there were, in Latvia in general, there was um, highest number of uh, Bentleys per thousand or per hundred thousand inhabitants in the, in the world before the crisis. And crisis struck the strongest because we had the speculative growth, the highest one, higher, um, we were the um, fastest growing capital city in the European Union, Riga. But crisis struck also the most, more than Greece. Can you imagine? Have you heard that from Latvians? It was 28 or 27 point something percent of GDP in, in first two years were like down. Okay, Greece had longer crisis, therefore it's maybe in total bigger, but in first years... Like, so it's not, uh, it's not about greed, I think it's um, just about conditions, how people live. Um, and, but the extremes are an interesting uh, field because in extremes you, you get these new drives, new uh, movements out of them. Like for example, also answering partly your, your um, comment, uh, what, what uh, value temporary use brings and social temporary use brings. Uh, we couldn't imagine Berlin or Amsterdam unless there were empty spaces in 90s uh, that were inhabited by unmeasurable social experiences uh, and something was created out of that, you know, you wouldn't have these cities. It's like a substrate. I think vacant spaces are like substrate. You need to have them in the city, low cost accessible vacant spaces which can be remodeled to, for, for anything to be alive. It's like compost. Yeah. Just a short word for this Camelot thing that I can't let go. <laughs> very briefly, very super briefly, cut to me if you want. I mean, that would be terrible if Camelot was torturing every single individual, and it won't work, right? Um, it's not because a service makes you, as an individual, happy that it's a service that we should um, encourage. I mean, probably lots of people here are flying with Ryanair. Um, people here maybe order... Um, whatever, yes, plenty of services are great for the, for the users, and I, I believe Camelot is just one of them. And, of course, they provide something great for you, super happy. But I think we shouldn't consider it only through that paradigm. And that's why we absolutely want to provide an alternative to that. And I think there again, the first question is like, how are the housing prices so freaking expensive that that is the best solution? And I think there is also a big difference in seeking long-term solutions and temporary use doesn't sound like a good idea. It's still temporary use. It's about innovating towards more sustainable long-term uses. And then I might maybe pick up on the aesthetics questions. Um, for me, actually, Brusselization has been the devil destroying uh, the urban uh, tissue of uh, Brussels. I don't know if you're familiar with the concept. It is unique to Brussels that in the 60s and 70s, profit-driven development has actually destroyed uh, major parts of our cities, talking about the VTC. I think it's an iconic example of how a neighborhood, everyday environments of people have been just totally being erased to build... Uh, uh, Manhattan-inspired offices. Which are empty now. Which are empty. And in temporary use by the developer themselves to build the new city. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to be very harsh. There's somebody with a microphone that I would really like to hear what she's got to share or ask. Because we have three more minutes left. 
So I'd like to first uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, kind of well, state of the art of therapy use in, uh, in Brussels and, and in Riga. And picking on Max's point about not reinventing the wheel, I'm the, the person Marcus was referring to, and I would like to share with you some in additional information that is publicly available to, to all of you, um, well, on the internet, and paper versions exist as well, um, which relate to many of the points and some points which were um, discussed today. So um, there was a network uh, funded by the Airbag program, which is a European program. Um, that's the network which brought together European cities so that they would exchange and learn from each other on temporary use. And um, so it's called the Refill Network, like refilling something. So you Google Refill and Airbag. And on that, you'll find some um, magazines with articles written by practitioners, um, municipalities, and NGOs, for example, like Marcis. Um, you have a very nice video about the win-win-win um, offer of temporary use that you can also use to, to promote it or to explain to people how useful it is. And there's also a roadmap to temporary use that we've developed where you can actually see where you are in terms of temporary use and what you need to develop next. And as um, just a few of the examples that we've shared uh, and that you can, you can find easily, uh, it's for example the matchmaking that happened in Cluj in Romania, the whole uh, Occupy Me campaign uh, that is um, detailed uh, by Marxist and also you get all the details about the tax reduction. You'll get some insights from Ghent, the way they, they, they develop a temporary use fund to support projects and also the specific regulation they have for short, uh, short term projects. Um, you also have uh, lots of interesting examples of what they do in Bremen in order to use temporary use for um, accommodating migrants. And you also have examples from, for example, Pols9, uh, which develops specific rent for um, temporary use occupations. So all these are uh, very concrete cases um, developed by, by the cities. Also checklists, also the article uh, Marcis was referring to about everybody says no in Nantes, and that's the name of the article. And you can get inspired and actually also get the contacts of all the people who've, who've, who worked on that and who are really struggling with that on a daily basis and it's finished, it was finished two years ago. So now you, they have also moved on so you can benefit from the experience in your daily work. Fantastic, thank you. Is there one last question? Oh, thank you very much again for the very nice uh, panel discussions. Um, I'm very curious about, in your vision, let's say for the next, um, I understand it's still a very open topic, but in your vision, what are the tools, the ways in which we can really create, um, let's say, participation of people? Because I think that's the main driver of this kind of uh, uh, activities. I mean, how do you see people participating into, into these spaces, into Since a fair the, way? Sorry, sorry. That's okay. As this is the last question, I propose that we just do a very brief each who wants to say something briefly, a reaction. I can start. Um, I think it was part of a discussion we had earlier this week on the side. It's a combination of need and vision. So there is an, a need, a need for housing, a need for having an atelier space, a need for uh, meeting each other without having to buy to drink. Um, and there is also vision. What do we dream for our, our city, for, for our future? And I think we need both of these together in order to have people participate. Yeah, I, I think this participation thing is, is tricky. So again, it depends what do we want to do. Uh, if, if your question is about the right to the city, it's to say like, to whom belongs the city and, and then can we use temporary space as a first step into that direction? Then I believe that these spaces should be definitely run or at least thought with their neighbors. Um, and that's a, a very concrete way to create participation. But then if the, the vision is the right to the city, which is something like a bit abstract, then it would be can we really define it together? How far do we want to get there? And then we need the, the institutions also to be on board. And, and, and I don't think, I mean, temporary use is just a very little drop in the thing. And that's very important to say, there's a lot of responsibility nowadays on temporary use for gentrification, participation. And it's like, hey, I'm here for two years. I have zero euros. I'm working with a lot of volunteers. Also, people are dying on site, working their ass off. 
for something that won't stay long. And so I think that's, that, that's the way I would answer to that. Thank you. Well, actually, I have the same question um, in the sense that uh, it's something on which we want to work, but on which we, as I said, we don't have the answer yet. And uh, I, that's why um, I think it's good that in the next uh, weeks and months, we will have some meetings with uh, some of the organizations here to develop um, this uh, theme more. I, I, it, this is a good question. What is participation? Really great question. I thought not to give some kind of stupid answer, uh, stereotypic. I think participation is, uh, so in economical, normal economical world, you would rent a, a room, you would take a space, you would do whatever there is, maybe you would meet neighbors sometimes, and maybe sometimes you would bar barbecue or something with them. I think for Free Riga, we define that people in, uh, in our system, they pay what is two times less as a membership to the, to the organization, but they invest their time in communal projects, do something there, build something there, organize something there, cook something for others, somehow support the system, give tools, uh, improve space to some other resident. I mean, to maximize time, which is not market-based uh, somehow div division, labor division. It's somehow, yeah, it's this other way of thinking which doesn't have such a, such a strong way how to calculate it, you know, because euros are easy, Time for social, it's not so easy. So we're looking for how to maximize social time. You can say it's expensive, not in euros, but it will be expensive because you will have to participate. That's the way to say it, I guess. Yeah. might not be the most beneficial thing for the other, or for, for your priority, the euro. But for you who work for the government, you have multiple ministries, presumably, and one of them is anti-radicalization, one of them is uh, education, one of them is uh, uh, tech or whatever. So if you put, if you get an investor who does like future programming training in your, uh, in your space, then that benefits you in another ministry. You just need to coordinate that, presumably. If, if, if shortly to answer, it is quantifiable. I mean, we'll write in our contracts that people have to pay this membership, which is much less than the rent would be, and they have to contribute these hours every 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 uh, month. But you don't know where the hours will go because that you know it's not like a business plan for a certain business model that you want to recreate. It cannot be like we will do this, this, this exactly in the contract. The, the hours, the time that people spend doing something, they will go, oh, there's like ad hoc, this situation, this event being organized, oh, we'll rest, restaurate these old wooden doors. It's like, in that sense, it's not so easy to measure. And when you try to measure it too much and regulate it too much, you kill creativity also. Thank you very much. The time is come to say goodbye. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you. I realize that the one hour and a half with these four people is nothing, is a drop in the water, same as the temporary use question. We're at the beginning, there's still a lot to do, a lot to happen, a lot to learn. But we have to finish now because there's a next event in 15 minutes that you're all happily invited to, and it's a conversation between forensic architecture and Sea Watch. If you want to, you can stay here. You're more than welcome. And otherwise, you can probably grab one of these on the way out and keep talking. Have a lovely evening. W we wanted to talk more with you, as, as you understood. Like, talk more with us.